kind of you know, science fiction, fiction has, has traditionally said that kind of there are these works that fit within it. And when we're talking about the, the Golden Age, I'm thinking about um, books that, uh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, one of the things I was thinking about is like, you know, authors like uh, Edgar Middleholzer, um, who has uh, this strong Brigham connection, who writes this sort of strong, fantastical uh, work like My Bones, My Flute, 1955, which I would consider uh, something uh, of the golden age um, that should be read by many um, science fiction and fantasy readers, but uh, would be, you know, no one's sitting here looking back at me and saying, mm-hmm, Edgar Middleholzer, yes, even though if I were to go down to the islands, um, that's the name that comes up again and again, along with other names that have done fantastic stuff when I'm trying to explain what it is I do as a writer. Um, so there's a second of like, what is canon? What should be canon? What should have been canon? Um, and then as far as the tarnished, it's just there's a very simple logarithmic growth in the number of books. So I think there's this point at which, um, you know, when I read uh, the romantics, when they would mention reading all the books that you're supposed to read in the 1800s, and it's like, yeah, that was possible to read all of literature in some manner in the 1800s, whereas, you know, in, in, in the 1940s or 50s, there was this point at which you could have read all the standout works in science fiction, more or less. But, you know, um, it's, it's interesting because even, even with that, you know, the, when you look back at the kind of the romantic reading list, right, of, you know, the classics for all, all in their original languages, of course, right, Greek, Latin, um, the thing is, there were tons of books being published in 19th century Britain that were not being read by, or, or they were being read by these guys, but they weren't discussed as like the canon, right? right? So like, like you know, pop boiler novels, kind of, you know, books starring housewives, and, you know, all, all this kind of stuff that, you know, uh, books about, you know, books of poetry written by plowmen, you know, like all this kind of stuff that like was, was um, uh, low literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and, and, and then, so it's, it's interesting to me because there, it's as you're saying, there are these, even if we're talking about the golden age, there are these right. works that nobody in science fiction, nobody, like, if you talk to most people at a con about, like, uh, Du Bois's, uh, W.E.B. Yeah. Du Bois's uh, kind of forays into science fictional stuff, people don't know what you're talking about, right? right. Or if you talk yeah. about some, some of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, black literature that was kind of delving into that stuff, some of the, you know, let alone kind of stuff in other languages and stuff like that. So, so even within the kind of constrained number of books being published uh, 80 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever, like even the, the, the canon that exists is even a subset of that, which it's, is like, uh, Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the, the entire idea of there being a, a, an established canon of, of fiction of literature in English that it was worthy of, you know, high-minded, uh, you know, um, postgraduate study <laughs> is an invention of the very late 19th century. It's, yeah. Uh, it comes along with, you know, Matthew Arnold and the whole, you know, whole realization that we're going to be a nation of shopkeepers in you know some of them are going to go to university and we can't expect these 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 bourgeois people to master the trivium and the quadrivium. So let's let's give them comic books. I need English literature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which up until then were just considered you know pop culture, um, you and think, perishable. Do you think that the um, structure of the canon is stricter for fantasy science fiction in being the more speculative than traditional literature? Well. And all, all, all communities try to you know, draw boundaries around themselves so that you know, we can have a story about what is us and what is not us. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, sometimes those, you know, those boundaries are very self-serving to you know, incumbent power and, and so forth. As, you know, as elicited by some of the things that Toby and, and Saladin were, were mentioning, that most people in this room won't have heard of or, or have read. Um, I've heard of the Dubois, I've not read any of it. Um, but you know, a, a charitable way of looking at this on, on the other side is that uh, well, science fiction is peculiarly made up of stories and conversation with each other. Um, you know, the, the, one of the greatest inspirations for for great science fiction has historically been reading another piece of great science fiction going, that's totally fucked up! I should have been <laughs> that story, but that's totally wrong! I mean, how many stories have been in response to the cold equations, you know? Right. Or the relationship of the Forever War to Starship Troopers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, Mary, Mary, um, Joanna Russ's We Who Are About To, one of my favorite science fiction novels, is a direct response to Marion Zimmer Bradley's Dark Over Landfall. Basically, and, and to all the, uh, you know, spaceship crashes on an uninhabited planet, and then we rebuild the civilization story, you know, Joanna's basically take me, no, we don't, we die! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, to, to have that, you have to have some kind of, 
Yeah, to have that work, you, you have to have, or at least delude yourself into having uh, a kind of body of works that you can expect most of your audience to have read. So I, I think that, that a lot of the latter day, you know, you have to have read a certain amount of this Golden Age stuff. It's kind of a desperate rearguard action by some of the older people in our field, which I include myself in. You know, you know, oh, please keep reading this stuff that we're still talking to. So we're, we're all in the same conversation. No, don't go off and have your own conversations. I'm old, lonely, and alone. All <laughs> but, you know, that's how culture works. So maybe the, the genesis of this whole debate is just that there's a challenge in this, what the story of us is becoming. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and I actually think what the story of us is becoming is pretty fucking interesting. So. Yeah. Well, I, I really think we're in a new golden age. Yeah, yeah me mean, too. There's so much interesting things being written right now. Okay, everyone. <laughs> this will drive me crazy and I will throw things at you. Silence your cell phones. Put them on vibrate. If it makes a noise, I will kick you out. I don't... Sorry, moderating. <laughs> I will lose my shit on you. Anyway, Golden Age right now, really, really cool, interesting stuff that you can't possibly read all of that published in a year. Well, and that, that's an interesting point to me, though, because, um, you know, it's, it's very, very, very easy and very valid for a thousand reasons to bash the entire concept of canon, right? I mean, there's a, a couple approaches, right? One approach is, well, we have to diversify the canon, right? Um, but Really, when we start, if you go far down that road, eventually what you end up with is like, you know, what use is a canon anyway, right? And, and it, it's, it's very easy, and there are a lot of good reasons to blow apart the whole idea of a canon. But, you know, what one loses with that is a sense of a, of a, of a shared literature to some degree, you know? And so the I conversation. Think, you lose think, the conversation. Yeah, you don't and, know and, who's and, talking to who anymore. And I, and I think that uh, it's, uh, I think to become anything other than, and, you know, we can debate whether this is even worth saving, but the, the, you know, to become anything other than a bunch of different fandoms, right, and to have any kind of uh, cohesive thread, there has to be some kind of unifying literature. Right now, I think it's mostly movies and TV, to be quite honest. That, that's, you know, I'm way, way, way more likely to have watched the same shows as somebody I get in a random conversation with at a con than I am to have read the same books as they are, you know, and uh, I think that's, um, I, I'm not quite sure why that is, maybe, maybe there's just less of it. But um, but I think that we uh, I think there is something noble about having a kind of set of shared texts that we we can all kind of uh, uh, converse about. Uh, but how you make the determination of what those texts are is like uh, God knows. Don't ask me to do it. I just want to critique it after it's done. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. You left out this. You unfeeling piece. Of shit. <laughs> okay. So how? feel about um, like the second part of the description of this panel is how should we be working towards building the canon or changing it or letting it evolve naturally? But what do you all feel about that? Should there be some sort of plan to this? <laughs> I think no matter what the plan is, the, 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 the writers and the readers will totally throw it out the window on us. <laughs> Suppose you're wondering why we called you all. <laughs> We're all part of the secret cabal to establish the canon. It's all on you. You want to be a big influence on, us on, on establishing the canon of what people read. Write about your own reading um, in a sympathetic, thoughtful mm -hmm. way. Yes. Yeah. 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 Seriously. Yeah. Buy, yeah. buy those books that you want to share and hand them and, to and, everyone. And, and, you and write about them. And write about them. Necessarily, not necessarily as formal academic literary criticism or as structured, you know, um, Buyer's Guide reviews. Just write about your reading, right? You know, write, write about uh, um, um, you know how this how this particular kind of book um, connects to some other um, reading experience you had long ago. Um, you know, write as if you are writing enthusiastic letters to extremely interested friends who you want to share books with. You know, leave, leave a record of, of your own thoughts and, and reactions. You know, I think that one of the modern masters of this is Joe Walton. Yeah. Has been yeah. doing as much of it lately, but for uh, several years there, from like uh, 2007 to uh, 2012, was just on fire, writing exactly this kind of informal, inviting, um, you know, essentially lengthy blog comment kind of, of, of essay on, on it. And, and she covered lots of lots of bright writers who don't get written about enough and uh, deserve to be taken seriously. People like C.J. Cherry, um, who has almost, uh, I think at this point, something like 75% of the existing critical literature about C.J. Cherry is a bunch of essays by Bill Walton. Really? Uh, and wow. she's a hugely major writer. I mean, right. You know, she's, she's popular, she's, she's been writing forever. Um, and she's, her, her work is of uh, intellectual and moral significance, um, and and she's just not on the scopes of the you know, of the big beasts of science fiction criticism, the John Clutes and so forth of the world. I mean, she never gets covered in 
Well, I, but it's interesting also because, like, I, I mean, criticism per se is like that's that's such a. I, I mean, it's like, it, the, the, other than like you know the occasional thing in the in the. In the in major newspapers and stuff like that, is like it's it's a very small world, right? I mean, as as with literary criticism in general. And the thing that I'm finding fascinating when you talk about leaving a, a record of your writing um, and putting Joe out there as the example is like massively intimidating, right? Because she's, <laughs> she's effortlessly uh, brilliant and, and erudite, and you know. But um, but I, I mean, you know, at a much more amateurish level, what I love seeing is just you know just. Bloggers, people yeah, who that's take what, it to, that's really to what I mean. yeah, no, no, I know. You know people who take it to uh, varying degrees of serious. And there are some people who are like, I am a book blogger, and they've you know either turned it into an actual job or something close to a, an actual job or semi-professional. I um, mean, then there are just people who are just uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, whatever. I'm a nurse or whatever I do, you know, or I work, uh, you know, uh, I could say a guy who's a construction worker who just writes up little things. They're not particularly you know uh, literary. His writing is very reader reactive, you know. But it's like it's. So cool, and he has these people that he has conversations with that um, probably are not reading formal criticism, you know, and they're, they're interacting with their buddies online and having these uh, these conversations that are, um, you know, I mean, thank God they're having. I I know that, you know, I mean, my book's not, a, you know, it's a solidly mid-list novel, but I know that some of its extended life, because it's been out for five years, four years now, um, some of its extended life has had to do with just just people bullshitting online and, and talking yep. about why they like it and 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 then. Two or three other people going. Oh yeah, I'm going to check that out. You know, I, I think that we we head trip ourselves about this concept of, for, of formal literary criticism or academic literary criticism or whatever, um, and you know, um, we, we don't necessarily have the right long term perspective on what literary criticism is. Part of this. I actually edited collections of of, liter of literary criticism over time about specific authors before I came to to, to This is what my job was for, for a second rate. Uh, um, um, reference publisher called Chelsea House, and this huge project that was supposedly edited by Harold Bloom was actually edited by a bunch of people in a small room. <laughs> <laughs> I met Harold Bloom once in the entire four years. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so I had to read a lot of literary criticism for the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, you know, and, and uh, this, this, this sort of super formal MLA, you know, in this paper I shall endeavor to yeah. prove, blah, 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 stuff is really modern, really recent. Yeah. You know, you go back to, you know, popular, uh, popular magazines about everything, which is what a magazine was, like the Edinburgh Review or whatever, you know, like, like 1700s, early 1800s. It reads more like the, more like blogs. It's, right, it's yeah, just, totally, it's, it's, it's totally. you know, so-and-so yeah. who's you know, known to be erudite and have interesting opinions, writing in a very somewhat unstructured way about, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, this, this particular Beaumont and Fletcher play or whatever, which, which hasn't been produced in a hundred years and you think should be produced now. Yeah. You know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, even even in academic yeah. criticism, it's gotten uh, the, the tone and the uh, level of pedantry has has gotten. You know, if, if you read academic uh, kind of writing about literature from 60 years ago, 70 years ago, there are all sorts of horrible sexism and racism yeah. in there. But the, uh, the 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 tone is much more conversational and much more essayistic. You know, yeah, well, and, and people got sick of that super clotted stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and going going back, just in this century, going back to essays like B.S. Pritchett and George Orwell and Edmund Wilson and so forth, who wrote for a popular audience of, of, of you know of people who are simply literate and have read a bunch of books, but aren't necessarily like trained right. literary historians, and, you know, formal scholars. Um, and and I, I, I just want to encourage the production of more of that kind of material in the yeah. conversation of science fiction, online, fanzines, whatever. Well, Mike, Michael Durbin does some of that. Which he does. He's very good at that. Yeah. Of course, it helps to have a brain the size of a planet and remember what <laughs> <laughs> Michael Durbin does. <laughs> Well, and the fact is, right now, there is a uh, massive cadre of young adults who are doing that for young adult yeah. literature on Tumblr. And that's one of the reasons yeah. that the young adults are so exciting right now. It's stunning and amazing yeah. to watch the production of criticism um, out there. And it is, it is actually really refreshing and engaging to uh, follow some of those, those writers. Yeah. Yeah. I've picked up a lot of really good book recommendations that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the interesting thing that the internet is doing, right? It's like that um, we're... we're Forming like eight thousand canons at once, right? Yeah. It's like there's because I, I could say you know there are like Muslim book blogs. There's there's an Islam and science fiction blog. You know they're like it's like like you can you can get down to fairly small kind of uh, uh, parameters, and there are still you know because there are a billion people in the world, it's six million people in the world. You know it's like people are going to there are going to be some number of people having this conversation about this minute uh, kind of uh, axis of things that. Um, you thought only you uh, kind of cared about, right? And uh, and then there's a hundred other people that are like, oh, you want like I, I literally see these conversations about me. You know, I, I ego Google often because 
<laughs> a secret egomaniac, right? And uh, so I, I, uh, and, and I see these conversations where people are literally like, I'm looking for a fantasy novel that's influenced by Islamic mythology, but reads really fast. And people are like, it's all, you know, it's the Crescent Moon. You know? and, and it's like, like the, the ability uh, of people to kind of form those lists for themselves and for each other is just, uh, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, but it's kind of a beautiful thing. I watched that happen live on a panel in Baltimore Book Festival where someone's like, you know what we've never seen? We've never seen Caribbean science fiction with like Rastas and spaceships. <laughs> and somebody in the front audience was right, just right. like, oh yes we have. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should say that. <laughs> I have Marshall McLuhan right here. <laughs> so uh, following, I suppose, along with that, uh, where do you see, like, in 50 years from now, what do you think we can and will look like for its shape or date? I think it's impossible to, to make that determination because things that were popular 50 years ago, we don't even remember now. Yeah. Well, is the canon what's popular? Because, I mean, we're sitting here being told, <coughs> no. you know, for science fiction, you've got to have read Heinlein, you've got to have read all these people that I've never read. My, it's, it's not that what is popular will be canon. My point is that we have no idea what will last and what will continue have, the conversation we have no idea and what will be responded to. useful to people. Yeah, well, what our criteria will be. Yeah, yeah. You know, writers go in and out of fashion for reasons that are, um, that are kind of profound sometimes. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know uh, Kipling is a perfectly good example of this because, you know, uh, he, he, he came deeply unfashionable because he was so clearly, you know, uh, uh, he was not just an imperialist, he was an imperialist, he was an, <laughs> he was an, an organist. But, you know, um, in more recently, uh, the psychological acuity of works like him um, have been um, something that people want to read even though they have, you know, he's problematic. Um, and and the, the, you know, this has happened with Shakespeare and with other Elizabethans, with, with 18th century literature and so forth. You know, well, we can't see what's going to be, it's not a matter of what's going to be popular, it's a matter of what, what people are going to want to go, go and look back at. You know, what, what's going to speak to their social, psychological, whatever condition, whatever, you know, in the, in the yeah, you know, the, the, the re-internment camps or the ice flows or whatever. Right. Right. Years right. from now. Right. You know, there's always that famous anecdote of the fact that the, you know, the same year Moby Dick came out, a much a much faster written and more pulpy and easier to read uh, whaling story of a giant whale that destroyed a ship also came out. Right. Yeah. Moby Dick was a commercial failure, yeah. and the other right. one uh, did extraordinarily well and was a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And uh, we despite, all read Moby despite Dick. the fact that Melville had had some successful book before that. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's it's it's. Uh, it's that, 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 you know, hanging out with writers, you spend a lot of time trying to predict what's going to stand the test of time, and, and the truth is I don't. Even stuff that doesn't quote stand the test of time may come back 100 years later. Like, we have no freaking clue. Yeah, somebody <laughs> finds it, writes a dissertation, and all of a sudden it's talked about again. Right. Who knows? I mean, Austin, I think Austin kind of fell out of fashion for a long time, and probably came back like 20 years ago, and is now huge again. I mean, novels about people trying to negotiate different difficult choices in their personal life in a world of, of, of very little social mobility. But that was also that was also a lot of uh, uh, feminist critics in the '80s yeah. kind of reclaiming her, you know, in English departments. So it's it's and it, it's interesting because we we think you know, it's this ivory tower thing, but that absolutely that repopularization of her in English departments absolutely led to like kind of. This trickle down to you know um, books, novels being really? reissued <laughs> to to like you know movie site. Yeah. It's the, those paths are just so hard. I mean, the thing to me is that, that that I would say is um, we, we don't know what uh, what will be canon. You know, fifty years from now, we don't know if there, what sense of a canon we're going to have. Um, but I, uh, you know, I think we need to as we look back because you know nominally this is supposed to be about the golden age, right? Um, and not necessarily canonicity per se. Um, I, as we look back, I, I really, uh, even though I'm online all the time, being like the, you know, like race, 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 you know, and, and like hardcore, you know, leftist politics around this stuff, I really, um, I think we need to be uh, cannily forgiving of the past, right? Uh, because I really want people to be cannily forgiving of the past. <laughs> 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 Let me finish. I, I don't mean um, I don't mean you know ignoring obviously uh, what's there and in fact right. it, it has to be a vital part of the discussion, um, but the uh, the notion that um, 
we can essentially disregard decades of, of uh, our forerunners' work uh, because because they were fucked up or because there's fucked up stuff in the work. Is sort of like well, there's always going to be, and, the, and and I don't just mean this because his, because I don't think progress is a straight line, but whenever you look at things people in another cultural context have done, it, so it's always going to look fucked up to you, you know, and some of it is, and and um, I, I just. I, I think that as we talk about how do we, what do we do with the canon? What do we do with the golden age specifically, as this panel is asking? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think slash and burn is any better of an approach right. than uh, like uncritical embrace, right? Well, what is the golden age? I mean, because for me, the golden age is 1980s cyberpunk because that's mm. when I popped yeah. in reading and really consuming yeah. science fiction in a huge way. Yeah. It wasn't until I encountered mm. science fiction as a community that I realized that the golden age for everyone else was like 1950s. <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm younger than everyone in this room. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's they just sort of. <laughs> they say that the golden age for anybody is when they, you know, whatever they read when they first get introduced to it. Right, so my right. own personal canon is something way different from yeah. what your personal canon is. Sure. The, the ancient part of the expression canonical phrase is, is, uh, was said by a, a fancy writer named Peter Graham in 1962. It's the golden age of science fiction is 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, that's, 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 I love that, yes. I love that quote. I think it's, I think it is, is dead on. Although I, I, you know, I, I, this, you know, you said cannily forgetting. I mean, one of the things I've really enjoyed doing, and I, and I started doing this when I was probably about 15, is digging into the Golden Age, because there wasn't a lot of Golden Age around when I started my reading. Yeah. It was this sort of like archeological find of this yeah. entire body of science fiction literature that was completely disassociated from my reading. And the thing is, for guys our age, we look at that stuff, and when you finally go back to the stuff that was written in the 30s or the 40s or 50s, you're like, oh, that's where this guy, yeah. Yeah. I always yeah. thought this came from like Dungeons and Dragons right. or whatever. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, it came from Fritz Lieber. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay, now, now you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you so. find these interesting nuggets of things that are not necessarily well known that really set you on fire. So, example, my favorite. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I think he would be considered Golden Age as Corbinier Smith as a short story writer. Mm -hmm. And I completely found him by reading an anthology of Golden Age SF and coming across his stuff. He was raised in, in China, basically, um, and, and had a, his, his, his real life is actually probably more fascinating than his science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as a result of just his strange, um, he's what, a, what do you call third culture kid. Um, as a result of his the way he was raised, um, there's so much resonance in his work for me as a third culture kid as well that across that gulf of time and and dated whatever, um, there's a freshness and uniqueness to his work that has absolutely um, blown me away. Even though it was something um, that normally I wouldn't have thought. Oh, I'm going to read this 1940s, 1930s era author and be really psyched about his work and. Contain it. 40s? 40s and 50s. 40s and 50s. Um, that this will be kind of my personal canon in terms mm -hmm. of like short stories that I, you know. Um, I'm so totally not surprised to hear that you're a big corporate person. <laughs> 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 totally Just for anyone who doesn't know the, the, the two sentences, the corporate person was actually a guy named Paul Lundberger who was raised in China of American parents, um, dip diplomatic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and had, had a career as a spook and wrote uh, one of the definitive textbooks on psychological warfare. Yeah. Yeah. And wrote some pretty amazing friggin' science amazing. fiction. It was just blown the mind. Just, Anyone still, who read still it way out of the in 1940s, 50, yeah. yeah. 1940s, 1950s could still be printed, yeah. as yeah. far as I'm concerned, and still blow your mind yeah. in terms yeah. of just like, what the hell is this? All in print from Nestor Preston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And, 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 and so, like, you, you mining it, you, you find these incredible little things that you just, you end up <clears> kind of, you know, become quite endeared to. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that, that I will say, um, we're, we're so primed to, um, as we should be, for the kind of uh, um, things that look hideous and bigoted to us now when we look at the past, that um, it's sometimes a pleasant surprise when you come across something and you're like, holy shit, this person was doing this 50 years ago? You know, um, I'm yeah. thinking of uh, Three Hearts, Three Lions um, mm -hmm. uh, by Paul Anderson. And, um, it's, you know, it's a portal fantasy, essentially, but he's got a character that's basically a Muslim knight, right, who's, uh, and it's, it's believe me, I mean, the cultural portrayal is all wrong, the details are all wrong, he's got everything wrong about the Muslim knight, right, but he's, but it's this attempt to have a heroic Saracen character, essentially, that is like, I'm reading this, I'm like, this is really cool, this yeah. is not what I expected to be coming across, uh, 
you know, so, so the golden age, I think, can, can surprise us, even as it often confirms our, our and it's, worst. It's, uh, it's okay to like problematic art, yeah. right, while course, recognizing yeah. that it's problematic, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this defensive mechanism where someone sees someone criticize their favorite art and they become really incredibly protective. Mm -hmm. But like all of the art we love is in, insanely problematic. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be, yeah, 100 years from now, there's going to be a bunch of, 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 more, of you know, what Rod Cayley calls more light on than requirements. Young, you know, mostly male blogger type dudes or whatever blogging is 100 years from now. We're going to say, you can't read any of that fucking 21st century stuff. They cut their fingernails. They had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they cut their fingernails. <laughs> or they all ate meat. Yeah, right? exactly. like, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. things yeah. like that that are essentially yeah. like, you know. Yeah. They kept the pets. How could they? <laughs> you know? They had no idea that you lost 10 IQ points every time you took yeah. the fingernail. <laughs> <laughs> you discovered it in 2050. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's also this thing of, of, of uh, imagining oneself as being uh, outside of history. Like, somehow, magically, yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody would be a slave owner if they lived in the uh, in, in antebellum south. But yeah. yet, somehow, <laughs> lots of people were, you know? So um, it, it's sort of like we, we assumed that we would have been better. But uh, I think in most cases, we're probably deluding ourselves. So. It's one reason, though, I do, I do love trying to champion those works that stood outside um, uh, that time that you were mentioning, because I think that makes them even more profoundly amazing. I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I find that you know there are many golden age pieces that I, that I that I've come across that I would be like, this is a, this is progressive for now. You know, um, yeah, you know, I was doing like a lot of research in comics actually, and digging up old 1940s comics, and you know, I just expected to find. Just kind of the same crap went off in kinds of comics today. And I was astonished at how many kind of, because of the kind of cultural conditions of World War II and, and women, uh, you know, in the factories and stuff like that, and having disposable income themselves to spend on comics, like there, there's like really tough self kind of, uh, 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 you know, self possessed, uh, economically independent women characters, superhero characters in these comics. And I'm like, but I was just, I, isn't new. It's just no, yeah, exactly. I think, exactly. And so I had I just had to start tweeting panels of this stuff. <laughs> I can't believe this shit was in comics seventy years ago. Yeah. And yet, Mr. Hayden assumes the bloggers will all be male. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, he's talking about a certain type. He's talking about a certain, about a certain, 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 certain kind of you know more 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 righteous than thou um, blogger, which I am in fact. But you know, based on based on. And in all things based on history is a really slender read. You know? Things, things yeah. change. You know? Maybe they'll all be blonde. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some category that we don't think matters. Um, so does the, it, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Does uh, it feel to you all that the uh, SNFF, SNFF community is making a statement <laughs> as a whole with things such as um, the recent results of the Hugos and the um, removing of Lovecraft from the um, the award for Lovecraft. Yeah. Award. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that the SF world ever speaks you know, unanimously. Now, that's that the Hugo results were pretty definitive <laughs> on one particular issue. Not, not, I don't think they were particularly so much pro progressive as, as anti fucking around with our award system. <laughs> 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 Don't game us, I and mean, if you game us really, really badly, we'll punish the crap out of you. <laughs> That's really what it was. I mean, tons of people voted against those the the, the, the puppy slate who who tastes run in the in similar directions to the stuff yeah. the puppies were promoting, whose politics are more right than left and so forth, but who you know had a big emotional investment in um, the uh, you know, in the, the untampered with Hugo's. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, I, I think that it is 2016. And it doesn't surprise me that everybody went, yeah, we just can't, we just can't argue in favor of that HP Lovecraft statue anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, well, even his contempt with some of his, uh, one of his, you know, high fantasy contemporaries, uh, you know, Bob Howard was writing him and going like, dude, you're going way over the line. <laughs> 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 like, so like, so 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 Bob Howard calls you racist. When Bob Howard is calling you racist. So like Hunter S. Thompson says you're taking too many drugs. Everyone says, man of the time, man of the time. No, but it was like, no, 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 no. Even the men of the time were writing to him and saying, guys, dude, chill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a defense. Um, and and, and it's, not a, it's not a complete and utter revocation of the importance his fiction had on the field. Because he, he continues to inspire 
many writers of all stripes, including many anthologies that are coming out that are people of color doing Lovecraftian tributes. Right. They wouldn't be doing that if they were kind of like, fuck all things Lovecraft. Right, exactly. They're just like, can we not have him represent an entire genre? Right. Right. Well, so that like, can we take the apparatus of the Cthulhu mythos and use it to tell progressive stories like Rosanna Ambrose did? Yes. You know, right. that, um, <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember the name of the something of Earth. I haven't heard much from you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but <laughs> when I have something, I say it. When I don't, I don't. <laughs> I, well, I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, in terms of um, the, the community, uh, as Patrick's saying, it's sort of like a, that's a monolith that I, I, I don't know how much it exists, but, um, you know, I, I, do, think, I do think there's a, a, a pretty definitive shift. And I, I